Well, good morning or afternoon or evening, whatever time of day you've chosen to tune in. Uh, we're glad to be back with you again and sharing with you out of the Word of God. Uh, let me just remind you at East Baptist Church, we are meeting on Sunday morning at 1045. Uh, we invite you to come and join us. Uh, we do encourage people to wear a mask as they come in, and once they're seated in the right seats, they can uh, take their mask off for the service and put them on when they leave. We do have the pews marked off every other pew and uh, asking people to remain at least six feet apart uh, in the services and so far everybody's been doing real good at that. So if you'd like to come and join us Sunday uh, at 1045, we'd be glad to have you. We also meet on Wednesday night at 630 to, to pray for our prayer meeting and uh, if you will want to pray and uh, would like to join us in at 6.30, uh, we'd be glad to have you for that also. A few uh, weeks back, we started a series called uh, Sound Doctrine and talked about doctrine or Bible teaching and what it meant uh, and went through uh, about six weeks of that. And then we did a, a lesson on uh, <clears throat> the fall of man and total depravity how man fell and uh, how he's a depraved creature before holy God. And then we uh, talked about uh, the freeness of salvation last time. Well, today I want to talk a little bit about the doctrine of God by using the question, do Christians believe in three gods? Or what is the Trinity? Now that's the term we use for uh, God. He's a triune being, a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But do we teach uh, and believe in three gods? A lot of people accuse us of that. And I want to answer that for you if I can during this time. You know, there are groups of people that will come to your door. They'll knock on their door with a Bible on their arm and a literature in their hand. And they'll challenge your belief in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as being a violation of Scripture. They'll say, you're violating the Holy Scripture, and they'll refer to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, which says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And they say that in uh, uh, believing in a triune God, uh, that we actually have three gods, not one God. And uh, they'll ask uh, us a question like, is it possible that you brought in a doctrine that violates uh, the most basic teaching of the Bible? Uh, have you introduced something that violates what the Bible teaches? Is it possibly uh, possible that you've uh, accepted uh, unknowingly a teaching that puts you at risk with God? And the anti-Trinity groups insist that when we speak about God as existing in three persons, we're establishing three gods. Now, they're right in saying that the word Trinity never appears in the Bible. That same group say, well, now, you know, there's no such word in the Bible as Trinity. And that word does not appear in, in, the, Trinity, uh, in the Bible. Uh, and they also say that this idea was transplanted into Christianity from Greek and Roman paganism. Is it possible they're right? Uh, are, are they right and are we wrong? Well, I want to try to answer that to, uh, in, the, in this Bible study. And I want to first talk about how important is the teaching of the three in one, the Trinity, our God being one person with three uh, revelations or personalities. Uh, for many centuries, uh, church uh, theologians have made serious claims in the support of the Trinity. Uh, they teach it's not pagan philosophy, that it's not polytheism. Uh, it's not a matter of semantics, that is the study of just the meaning of words. It's the fact that the one true God exists in three distinct persons, and it's a biblical teaching and of greatest importance. Now, all major branches of Christendom uh, also agree that three in one God is consistent with the trail of Old Testament evidence for the same doctrine. In the Old Testament, the word translated God uh, some 2,570 times is Elohim. Now, the, uh, Elohim is a plural term. Uh, in the beginning, God, Elohim, 
Jehovah. But in uh, all but five instances, it refers clearly to the one God who is creator, sustainer, and master of everything. Not a plurality of gods, but the fact that he, he is the creator, he is the sustainer, he is the master. Now, God sometimes is used uh, a plural pronoun when speaking of himself, when God spoke of himself. He said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Our image, our likeness. That doesn't sound like one there. Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil, Genesis 3.22. What does he mean, us? Our. What's he mean? Well, when Moses declared that uh, God is one in Deuteronomy 6, 4, he used the same word he had used to describe one flesh uh, relating to uh, a love, uh, the relation of a man to a woman. The two become one flesh. Now, we know that they're still two distinct persons, don't we? But they're one flesh. They're one. Because we can't understand, there's no reason to object. So, uh, how important is the teaching of three and one? Very important because it's biblical. The tri triune nature of God is biblical. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is biblical. Now, what is the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit? If we have a Father, Son, and Spirit rolled into one God, what's the relationship? Well, the New Testament relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, disproves the conclusion that the Father alone be thought of as the only true and most high God. That's what some say, just the Father. You see, the God of the New Testament, however, links his own name to the threefold designation as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The New Testament shows that the Father makes our relationship to him dependent on our relationship to the Son and our relationship to the Son is dependent on our relationship to the Spirit. Uh, this God certainly shares his glory among three persons. Uh, all who will accept the love of the, uh, who, who in turn receive the love of the Father, with three persons, and those who receive, in turn receive the love of the Father and also accept the love of the Father, Son, and Spirit. They all three love us. Now let's look at the Father as God first. Let's break these down and see how this all rolls together. The scriptures reveal him as the Father of the Hebrew nation. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 6 says, Do thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people. Is not he your Father who created you and made you and established you? So the scripture establishes him as creator. Malachi 2.10, have we not all one Father? Has not one created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? So the, the scriptures reveal him as the father of the Hebrew people. But Jesus called God his Father in John 15, or 5, 17 and 18. He said, but Jesus answered, my Father is working unto now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he is even calling God his father, making himself equal with God. Now, do you understand what that says? That says the Jewish people understood that when Jesus said, my father's working until now and I am working, the Jews said he was saying, as saying God is my father, that he was equal with God. Is that not true? Is not the Son equal with the Father? Yes, he is. But the Jews said, oh, he's making himself God. That's what the anti-group uh, that tells us there's no triune nature to God says to us. Oh, we're, we're making Jesus God. Well, he is. Uh, Jesus called him his Father. He's taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven. He told us that we're to come to the Father in his name. John 16, 23 said, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. What you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. We're to come to the Father in the name of Jesus. Well, that's strange if he's something lesser. Uh, Paul referred to him as the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, 2 Corinthians 1.3. Listen, 
if Jesus isn't God and we pray in Jesus' name, that is, we're praying as if Jesus would pray, then we're going through something less than God to get the Father. You don't go through people. You don't go through anything less than God. You go through God's Son, Jesus Christ, to get directly to the Father. The Son is seen as God. The Father is seen as God, but the Son is seen as God. You see, the New Testament writers were repeatedly referring to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Now, what does that mean, Son of God? Well, our Jehovah Witness friends uh, take this expression to mean that he was a, a Son of God. That is, uh, much like the angels and other human beings, uh, he was a created being just like Lucifer and the angels and all the rest. That doesn't really fit the scripture, does it? The Jews today say that Jesus was a great prophet, but nothing more than a great prophet, a good teacher. The Muslims have the same view of Jesus. He's a great prophet. He's not God. He's just a great prophet, great teacher. But the New Testament, our Bible, however, teaches that Jesus is the only son, that is, the unique son of God. There's not another like him, not one before, not one after, never will be. He's the unique son of God. John 1, 14 said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only glory of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The word was made flesh. If you'll notice in your Bible, word is a capital word. That's, that's not like a written word. That's not like a, uh, just an ordinary term word. This is a living word. Logos is the Greek word. And verse 18 said, no one has seen God. The only God uh, uh, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. That is, Jesus has made known God uh, to us. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who was made flesh and dwelt among us? Jesus. The babe in Bethlehem, born of the virgin, was God in human form and lived among us. And we've seen his glory as the glory of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. He's God in human form. No one's ever seen him, but uh, Jesus has revealed him to us. What we know about God is what we see in Jesus. Now, uh, John 3, 16 and 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the only name, uh, begotten, uh, name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, now stop and listen. God loved us and he gave his Son to die for us. If Jesus is just a man, a good teacher, a good prophet, how could he pay for my sin any more than I could pay for my sin? You see, man can't pay for his sin because he's a sinful being. Jesus is different because he is God in human form. He was born of a virgin, no sin blood in him. And if we don't receive him, we're already condemned. Not will be, but we're already. So if Jesus is less than God, he's not a savior. John uh <clears throat> 5, 8 says, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. That's an unusual statement. Here's Jesus saying, before Abraham came into being, I am. The Jews had a little trouble with that because they said, Abraham's been dead for thousands of years. And you are, say, before Abraham was, you are. Well, listen to this in Exodus three fourteen. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's how God identified himself to Moses. I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me. I am who that I am. I am that always has been and always will be is what he's saying. So when Jesus said before Abraham was I am, he used that same term that God uses of himself saying, I am God in human form. <laughs> well, the, the Jew, Jews didn't uh, like that too well. And uh, it said, uh, I, verse 30 of, of uh, John 10 said, I and the Father are one. 
The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered and said, I've shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for good work that we're going to stone you, but for the blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. What was they angry with him about? Because he healed people? No, because he had proclaimed himself to be almighty God. You see, Jesus is God in human form. When Jesus, you know, appeared a lot of times and uh, the scriptures portray Christ as, as sharing the glory of a jealous God who through Moses insisted that no one deserved to be worshiped but God himself. God shares his love with angels and mortals, but he shares his glory with his son. Uh, our God is eternal. Uh, he, he's inter eternal. I am who I am. I always have been. I always will be. The Jews wanted to stone Jesus because he identified him as the I am, the one that always has been and always will be. He said, I am. I, me and the Father are one in essence. I'm God in human form. And, and, and you have the testimony of the apostles. Look at John 20, 27. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put on, out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus didn't rebuke Thomas for calling him God. Why? Because he was God. He is God. He didn't rebuke him. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That would have been blasphemy if he wasn't God. You see, John 1 said this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now get that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with, was God, with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him it was life, and the life was the light of men. And then down in verse 14 again, and the Word became flesh. What? The Word was in the beginning. The Word was with God. The Word is God. And the Word was made flesh. What was made flesh? Jesus as the babe in Bethlehem's manger. And dwelt among us, we've been seen his glory as the glory of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Your Bible teaches it. He is God in human form. He's Theos. T-H-E-O-S. That means God. Not uh, not theos, T-H-E-I-O-S, a lesser form of deity, and that's what some would tell us is. He's a theos, not theos. He's a lesser form of deity. No. Titus uh, chapter 2, verse 13 said, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul said to Titus, he's God. Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Simon Peter said the same thing. He's our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the prediction of the Old Testament uh, uh, tells us that, you know, in, in Isaiah's uh, writings, he said, you know, that for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. This is Isaiah 9, 6. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful or Counselor, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A child is born. Who, wh who's the child? A son is given. Who is? It's Jesus. That's prophetic of Jesus. And what does Isaiah say? He's mighty God. He's everlasting Father. He's the Prince of Peace. Can you get the picture now that the Bible says that Jesus is not less than God? He is God. So the Father is God. Jesus is God. What about the Holy Spirit as God? Well, look in John 14. It said this. Jesus said, and I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper or comforter to be with you forever. 
even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for it dwells in you. He dwells in you and shall be uh, with, uh, dwells with you and shall be in you. Now, Jesus came in bodily form and dwelling. How does he do it? In the form of the Spirit. The Spirit is God. Now, if you want further scripture, listen to this. Uh, in uh, Acts chapter 5, this is the account of Ananias and Sapphira lying about what they get in. They saw all the other people giving uh, their possessions and all that, God blessing them, people bragging on them. They had a piece of land, they sold it. And they said, we're going to give it all to God. Sounds good, doesn't it? But when they sold it, it brought more than they thought. And they conspired. Satan put it in their heart. Why don't you keep a little of it and give it? And you can say, we're giving it all, but keep a little. Nobody knows the difference. So they did. Well, Peter said this to them when they did it. When he said, is that all of it? That's all of it. Oh, praise God, we gave it all to God. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now stop and think. Satan Got you to lie to the Holy Spirit, Peter said, okay, and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it was unsold, did it not remain your own? Before you sold it, wasn't it yours? Of course. And after you sold it, was it not at your disposal? Of course. Why is it then you have contrived in your heart, you have not lied to man, but to God? Now, wait a minute. He said you lied to the Holy Spirit. Now he says you've lied to God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. Do you, see, do you see how clear the scripture is on, on, the, on the fact the Holy Spirit is God? He's not a lesser than God. He is God. The Holy Spirit's called God. He's a person, for only a person can love and only a person can be grieved. And in, in Ephesians 4.30, it said, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you're sealed until the day of redemption. It, if he's not a person, he can't be re, re, uh, grieved. And as God, he's grieved at our sin. He, he leads and he guides us. For Romans 8, 14 said, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. He leads us in the right path. Man can't always lead you right. The Holy Spirit will. Uh, uh, he teaches us, John 14, 16, 17, And I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Did you hear that? The Holy Spirit dwells with you and shall be in you. I'll ask the Father for another comforter for you. You're led by the Spirit of God. You're the child of God. He, he guides you, he leads you, he teaches you. Our teacher is the Spirit of God. <clears throat> and he calls and commissions uh, 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 people. Listen to Acts 13. Now there were in Ante uh, the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I call them. They were worshiping the Lord and the Holy Spirit spoke to them. How's God speak to us through the Holy Spirit? And he said, set them apart. God's the only one has the power to call men. Men can't call men to the ministry. Only God has the power to do that. And God, through the Holy Spirit, is calling and saying to the church at any set these people apart that they might go and serve as missionaries carrying the gospel. So he calls. He commissions. He's not just a force. He's a person. He's named with the Father and the Son as God. In, in Matthew 28, he said, <clears throat> baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one. Not the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're not baptizing in the name of three gods. We're baptizing in the name of one God who reveals himself as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, that being said, that yes, the Bible does reveal God in three separate persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do Christians believe that in three gods or one God then? Well, the Bible definitely teaches that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but it shows that each is a distinct personality. That adds up to three gods, right? No, 
only if you're dealing with mathematics and thinking of three separate people. We're not dealing with mathematics. We're not thinking of three separate people. We're thinking of one. We're thinking of God. We're dealing with God who is revealed in the Bible as one God who existed eternally as three distinct, not separate, persons. God is one being, not three. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not three separate persons. They're one God, but we've distinguished between them, uh, but we can't separate them. See, there's a distinction. As distinct persons, each functions in his unique manner. The Father is the originator. The Son is the agent by which God created the world. The God spoke. There's the word that we read about in John. And Jesus is the agent of redemption. The Holy Spirit is the administrator or the applicator. The Holy Spirit must reveal to us we're sinners, reveal to us that Jesus loved us, reveal to us that Jesus died for us, and trust him to be our Savior. We're led there by the Holy Spirit. All three were involved in creation. It was by him, Jesus Christ, that God created all things, Colossians 1, 16 said. It's talking about Jesus. By him, Jesus, all things were created. Their creation count in Genesis 1, 2 speaks of the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the earth, the face of the waters. The Spirit hovered over them. In salvation, God the Father loved and gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, John three sixteen. So all three are clearly seen at the baptism of Jesus. For when Jesus was baptized, here you got Jesus in the water with John. You got the Holy Spirit descending on the, the shoulder of Jesus at, in the form of a dove. And you got the Father speaking from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son on whom I'm well pleased. You've got them all three present as one. Jesus affirmed the Trinity when he uh, commanded us to baptize in the name of the Father and of the the Son of the Holy Spirit. That is not in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit, but in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One. In this God, uh, we have a Heavenly Father who loved us and gave His Son for us. In this God, we have Jesus Christ, a brother who became one of us and to take our punishment that we deserved, who understands our pain, who isn't ashamed to call us His brothers and sisters, even though we continue to be weak and imperfect, uh, God, uh, in this God, we have the person of the Holy Spirit as our helper, a uh, divine comforter who, who lives uh, in us to strengthen us and give us victory over sin. This uh, triune God hears us when we pray. He understands us and feels for us when we suffer. Uh, he'll be with us at the time of our death to see us safely home. All three of them have three distinct, a distinct role, but they're all rolled into one person, God, revealed in those different roles and personalities. So the designations of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not indicate rank, but function. The Father as the originator, the Spirit, the Son as the agent, and the Holy Spirit as the applicator, and it's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descending, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit equal with each other. The Trinity cannot be fully explained. It can't be fully illustrated. I mean, you, you can go crazy trying to explain it and illustrate it, but we've got to learn to live with a God that we cannot fully comprehend. You say, how can you have three in one? Well, you can't comprehend. If you was able to figure all that out, you'd know you'd be God. And you're not. I'm not. C.S. Lewis uh, said this. If Christianity was something we were making up, of course we could make it easier. But it isn't. We won't compete in simplicity with people who are inventing religions. How could we? We're dealing with a fact. Of course, anyone can be simple if he has no facts to bother about. You take out the facts and you can be as simple as you want to be is what he's saying. Well, I hope in some way this just sparks some interest in you to study your Bible and to learn uh, about the Trinity, the triune God, who reveals himself in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but is one God, and we worship one, not three. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all those who are listening. Thank you, Father, for the fact that you loved us enough to send your Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit to dwell in us as your people. 
the Holy Spirit is here to convict men of sin and to bring them to Jesus. And Father, you're overseeing us and Jesus is available to us as our intercessor to carry our needs to you. Lord, I thank you for revealing yourself to us so completely and so practically. And then Lord, I, I pray for those who may be listening who are sick, I can't get out. I pray you'd bless them, heal their bodies. Those who, Lord, are, are quarantined, those who are uh, in places that uh, can't have company in our nursing homes or Lord, our our uh, assisted living facilities, hospitals. Lord, protect them and bless them and bless their families during this very difficult time. And Lord, uh, for those who, who feel that it's dangerous for them to be out in such an atmosphere, I pray you'd meet with them and hold them close and let them know you love them. Let them know that you, you understand and you're with them and you're there to guard, guide, protect. Lord, may we look to you with thanksgiving in our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today.